Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the OpenShift TV coffee break. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy today to start our weekly series about the OpenShift coffee break. I'm here with my friend, uh, uh, Andrea. How are you, Andrea? Hi, very well. I'm from London. Oh, uh, from London. And I'm here with my friend, Tero. How are you, Tero? Awesome. Thank you. Oh, nice cap. Um, today we have a special guest, but before presenting our special guest and our topic, please uh, enjoy your coffee because this is the OpenShift coffee break. Um, so welcome to Dario Tranchitella that uh, to, will kick off our new series about uh, how to write an operator on Kubernetes. Hi, Dario. How are you? Hi, Natale. I am really good. Thanks a lot. Really happy to be here. So why we invited Dario? The people may think, oh, why you invite random people from the community and, and they, they start talking about everything? Um, Dario um, is experienced, uh, passionate about uh, Kubernetes operators, and actually he wrote an operator using Operator SDK. So that's why we invited uh, today uh, him to share his uh, experience with this tool and also to explain us a little bit how what is an operator, uh, why we should write an operator on Kubernetes uh, and how we can make production grade operator. That I said production uh, word. Did uh, did I raise any alarm in your systems? No, no everything is fine. Don't worry. <laughs> mm, production grade. Uh, let's use the first hour to define production grade. <laughs> well, production way production grade is v1 of a one API version. You know. <laughs> Ah, yeah, okay. correct. <laughs> so, folks, let me try if our macros in the chat works. I'm writing, oh, that works also from here. So, uh, you see in the chat on your right, if you are from YouTube or Twitch, um, you, we use the chat to uh, send a question to the, to the people uh, in our show. So, if you have any question during the show, please uh, send in the chat. We will uh, send all the questions to Dario uh, that he need to also, he needs to uh, reply live, uh, of course. And Dario is here, Tero and Andrea, also for uh, live demos, uh, because this is mandatory for this show, uh, as usual. Um, today, we don't have Jafar. Uh, Jafar uh, today was uh, busy. We will uh, have it uh, next, uh, the, the next Wednesday. So the, the first big news, folks, is that the OpenShift Coffee Break now goes weekly. If you look at the OpenShift uh, calendar, and I'm uh, sending the chat uh, soon. You will see that now our, we are weekly and we have a, a very cool schedule. There's the operator, new operator uh, series. There, the database as a service series. We have lots of people. The next time we will have the uh, Red Hat Hackfest winner. So we're really excited to to be uh, kind of uh, promoted to a weekly show. And after this uh, wording, uh, Dario, Tero, Andrea, do we want to start from the basis? So what is a Kubernetes operator? Oh, one more, more important question. Are you going to double our compensation since we have twice many shows now? Ha, uh, well, I don't think so, but we can... Zero, we can times two, <laughs> zero, zero times two is still zero, so we have, I think that we are fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, we can check, we can, uh, we can raise this uh, concern, uh, but uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so Dario, coming back to the, to the topic, what is an operator? Well, uh, I had many discussions about that because a lot of people say, well, an operator is just a new buzzword to say that a custom controller, you know, because uh, sometimes we tend to miss that uh, Kubernetes is made of several components of several controllers. When you deploy a service account, when you deploy a role binding and so on and so forth, there is a controller that is doing all the magic. So when you create the service account, you are going to get the secret with all the stuff containing it. So essentially there is a controller, but I wouldn't say that an operator is just a simple controller. Okay. Why this? Because, uh, we have always to remember that terminology is really important. When I operate the cluster, I'm an operator, okay? It means that I know all the stuff that is going on inside the cluster. I know the business logic, all the moving parts. And it means essentially that I'm creating all the domains logic, all my business logic 
from the operator side, so from the human side inside an application. That could be a Go operator, could be an Helm operator, an Ansible operator, and so on and so forth, whatever you want. So essentially, I will say that the operator is the translation of a human form <laughs> in a binary form of all the cluster management. So it's something uh, more in advance than a simple controller. Deal with that. It's, it's good that you mentioned the word controller. I think, uh, Dario, we need to understand that kind of uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes uh, internals. Uh, yeah. Can we? Can you explain to to us and to the audience uh, uh, what is this concept of controller? Because I think this is really important to understand. Sure, sure. Let's go from the basics. So uh, when we spawn a pod, well. Let's start from the beginning. So I would like to spawn an application on my cluster. Yeah, I can do that in many uh, ways. I can create a demo set. I can create a deployment. Sometimes all the Hello World examples says that, OK, you have to deploy your deployment. So it's much easier. So when we deploy a deployment, sorry for the uh, words joke, um, essentially, we are ending up with multiple resources. The final effect, the final result is going to be a pod inside the namespace. But that pod uh, is a direct consequence of a replica set. So when we create the deployment, we are getting a replica set, and then the replica set is creating the pod. It means that uh, from the Kubernetes control plane perspective, we have several components. We all know that we got etcd, and etcd is our uh, hearth because we are containing all the information about the cluster state. Then we got the API server, so the REST API that we are using to interact with the control plane. We got the scheduler, and then we got also a component that is named controller manager. And this controller manager is a huge monolith <laughs> full of controllers. And all these controllers are watching uh, for some actions. So when we are creating a resource in our etcd, or I would say in our backing storage, uh, these controllers are going to take uh, this request and translating in other resources. So when we create the deployment, the controller deployment is going to create the replica set. And the replica set is going to create, finally, the pod. So these are a sort of binaries, I would say not operator, because otherwise we could um, create some confusion there. But they are watching for some resources and applying to the desired state. So translating from the imperative way of saying, I would like to get this stuff that is going to be persistent and stored in etcd and then translated in some other resources. Well, uh, thanks, Dario. This, this was very, very helpful to understand internals. In the while you were speaking, I, I put in the chat some links to the Kubernetes operator pattern, Kubernetes components, because you mentioned ETCD, you mentioned the controller. So I think it's very good to understand how they work. But thanks for this uh, explanation, because uh, uh, this, I think, is, is the introduction to uh, everything. No? Um, and uh, Dario, before you go in, in, in depth, I want to do unchange here. So if you see, since we're talking about the operator, let me put the, this new background here. Okay. So now I'm ready to talk about Kubernetes operators. And uh, yeah, that was a, a little joke I was planning, but uh, it's cool because uh, also we will share the link uh, to download this uh, ebook for free about Kubernetes operators, but today here, we're here at Dario for live demos, live show. So the first thing, I, I don't know, if, Tero, Andrea, if you have a question for this introduction about the internals, um, before, if, if you don't have a, a question about the, those internals, uh, I think we can go to the first step, Dario. So uh, we understood the, 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 the introduction. Uh, now we would like to understand the, uh, why operators uh, for building a new operator and uh, and how to do it? But first, sure. Tero, Andrea, any any question for these internals? Uh, uh, nice. No, that 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 was spot on because it, it's not easy to explain what happens 
in Kubernetes cluster. People know ports, services, and everything, <laughs> but what is actually happening there? So it, it's it's not easy to explain, and that was a really good one. And yes, I think maybe maybe one one thing that could could be added to that is uh, that you have the freedom to decide how you would implement it by by coding it, and you have choices on how you code it. Yeah, absolutely. I was missing also another example that could be more easy to understand because I was, you know, um, when we deal with Kubernetes, sometimes I'm feeling uh, the toughness, the fact of the knowledge, because I know a lot of stuff. I know a lot of internals. So maybe it's better to try to explain also controllers with a simpler example. So we have a pod. Okay, that's great. A pod is made of several containers. We got C groups and spaces, volume mounts, and so on and so forth. But pods, they got also some IP addresses. Okay, let's keep it uh, for single IP. Uh, so <laughs> let's avoid dual stack. Okay, uh, how can we get the traffic to that pod? It means that we have an endpoint resource. So it means that we got a controller. And that's the endpoint slice or the endpoint controller that is watching for pods, getting their IPs, and then finally updating to the endpoint resource so we can get traffic from other services to the pods. So it's much maybe it's much better uh, explaining how controllers are working. And yeah, Andrea, you're totally right. So controllers are doing stuff for the Kubernetes stuff. Okay. Instead, operator is something that you can. Craft. I would say it's craftsmanship. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I would like to also remember, uh, remember the people in the chat that I, that I see more people are coming. If you have any question to Dario, please uh, send it to the chat. So we will uh, we, we have the chance to reply your question this uh, hour. Uh, but I know, uh, Dario, that there will be more and more questions while uh, you kind of uh, hands on. So when you are ready, let me know, and I can we, we can start in, in in the in the deep dive. Sure, sure. So let's go for the code. Or do you would like to get also a sort of brief introduction why I'm here explaining why operators are so important? Yeah, please, please. Uh, and do you want with your do you want to share anything or um, or or not? Do you have any uh... any? Well, well, uh, we can start with the code because you know I yeah. really love the code, so it's pretty that simple. Okay. Another uh, one, only one thing, Dario. Uh, can you please increase the font? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the people, because this is an embedded window, so the the people can see. Thanks. It's good. I yeah. Guess so. Yeah. 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 So writing an operator is really simple because what you have to do is to pick a human form put it in front of the terminal and say, operate the cluster. Now, jokes apart. So uh, we are lucky enough because we got a lot of stuff uh, out there. Uh, my first experience writing operator was using the sample controller. Although you're saying, Dario, uh, you just told us that controllers are not operators. Well, you're right, but it's the starting point. And uh, a lot of tools are right there. We got Cube Builder, we got Operator SDK, we got also CAP, if I remember correctly the name. So you can write whatever you want uh, in whatever language you will like. And honestly, uh, during these years, I felt very good with Operator SDK for several reasons. I had also experience with Cube Builder, but I guess that Operator SDK is good enough because in the end, uh, is not so much opinionated. I mean, uh, the operator is not just code. Well, it's code, but it's more a pattern behind that. Uh, I still remember that CoreOS were the inventors of the operator pattern. And what is uh, an operator pattern? So essentially, you got a request, a reconsider request, and you're watching uh, the current state and moving it towards the desired state. So it's a reconciliation loop, something that we already know in Kubernetes because uh, it's the core concept behind Kubernetes. Uh, there is a drift in the configuration. I apply all the changes to reach out uh, to the desired state. 
So uh, with the operator pattern, um, we can get everything that we want. So we can put our business logic and it means that we can do it in several ways. We can write our code. And honestly, I really love that way because I'm a former software engineer, or at least I'm I'm still a software engineer because uh, it's like a mark. You cannot get out of that. But you can also break the cluster using Helm, using your Ansible. It really depends on the scope of your operator. So Operator ZK is really good at uh, doing this stuff because it says you can use Ansible, you can use um, uh, whatever you want. So you can write your code. So I'm feeling very good about that. So how to write that? So obviously we need our binary. It can be downloaded by... Dario, one, one quick question. If you Because at the end of the day, operator is just yum files and container in the cluster, just simplified. And you can create operator without the SDK. How yeah, much the SDK, SDK helps you to do that? If you compare that simple operator with SDK takes X amount of time. So how, how much more it would take without the SDK? Uh, a lot of time, honestly. Uh, it's a question more regarding software development, I would say, because uh, it's a common question that we I faced several times across my career when I was working in our companies that were saying, so should we use a framework or should we build our framework? And it's a matter of payoff, you know, because uh, you can create your framework, that's good enough, but there is a downside. And the downside is that you have fully ownership of that project. So it means that you have to upgrade it, uh, doing bug free age, uh, doing implementations and so on and so forth, and also providing documentation and ramp up for new developers because it's something that is not public, or at least it couldn't be public. Instead, if you go for something that is a sort of standard or something that is provided by the community, like Operator SDK, it's much easier because there are plenty of examples. There is a community. Uh, it's much more easier. Also regarding the debugging, uh, across my career, I had also the pain to debug others others operators and the best way to do that is to looking at the code okay because code doesn't lie <laughs> so when you code doesn't lie I, I like this can we can we have a caption code doesn't lie, uh... code doesn't lie. <laughs> that's true by the way because uh when i have to try to understand what's going on uh, if I open a project that has been scaffolded using Operator SDK, I can easily jump out to the section where I think the bug is. Or if I have to check out the API types, or I have to check out also, I don't know, the, example, the examples of the custom resource definition, it's that simple. Otherwise, it will be a pain because, you know, um, it's like creating a, a new protocol. There are plenty of protocols. All they, all of them sucks. Uh, all of them suck. So let's create a new protocol. Well, it's not a kind of way of working. So uh, I hope I replied your question. Yeah, that was just just the audience understand that the SDK is it, this really an SDK that helps you to get started. Yeah, it's yeah. really that simple. That simple. I can that, show you uh, that. Sebi in the chat okay. said, now with Operator SDK, you can also scaffold uh, uh, Quarkus Java uh, Operator project. Uh, this is uh, true, and we will see in the next episode on uh, second, March the 2nd. But uh, uh, Dario, uh, this is also introduced uh, the concept. So right now we're seeing we are scaffolding a new operator, but is it language specific? Uh, uh, can I develop my operator in any programming language, or is there any preferred programming language? Well, actually, with Operator SDK, you have to write everything in Go. And okay. I would say that uh, I had several questions regarding should we use Go or Python or Java and so on and so forth. And 
Honestly, it really depends. But I understand that saying it really depends uh, doesn't answer any questions. So I will try to elaborate a bit more. So if your yeah. team uh, is mostly focused on Java or Python or whatever language you prefer, I don't think that the payoff is positive switching over Go, okay? Because that will require a huge mind, new mindset of developing. Uh, I really hate when I see Python code that has been wrote in a um, different way, in not, not in the Pythonic way, you know? And the same also applies for Go. When I see Go that has been written by people that works mostly in Java, I will, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know uh, <laughs> if I can say bad words, but that will be really bad, bad, bad. So uh, let's try always to focus on your knowledge. So if you would like to extend Kubernetes and you know Go, you can use Operator SDK. Otherwise, you can use whatever you want. I don't think that the runtime here is, uh, is the silver bullet, okay? Uh, the real silver bullet is translating all your business logic inside the operator because the operator is just a tool. The runtime, Go, Java, Python, or whatever you would like to use is just a tool. It really depends how you implement this stuff. Gotcha. Gotcha, great, great. Anyway, keep in mind that Operator SDK is scaffolding projects in Go. I really love Go, honestly. Um, I really love some stuff of Go. Sometimes I miss some features, but keep in mind that that's really cool. And since you were talking also regarding uh, Quarkus, I just wanted to point out this, because keep in mind that Operator SDK allows oh, wow. also uh, to put some plugins here. So, um, so you can pick your kind of uh, programming language or tools like I see Ansible, Helm, uh, Customize and, uh, and Quarkus. So you can scaffold a new project uh, using one of these uh, programming language or framework. Well, uh, keep in mind that these plugins is something that has been you know, written by KubeBuilder because there is a long story behind the cooperation between Operator SDK and KubeBuilder. Uh, KubeBuilder, if I call correctly, was one of the first projects that was working on developing operators. So uh, at that time, I was working for a company and I was in the middle of choosing, should we go for KubeBuilder or should we go for Operator SDK? And I did some proof of concept in both frameworks and finally, I went for Operator SDK for several reasons. But we are in a good spot right now because after some efforts, uh, they started in 2019, if I recall correctly, uh, a sort of fusion, a sort of cooperation between KubeBuilder and Operator SDK started with a deep integration. So uh, just to say that these are KubeBuilder's plugins, and these plugins are really useful if you would like to scaffold the code according to your needs. So in the end, uh, with Operator SDK, you're ending with creating Go code, but with the plugins, uh, you have the chance to scaffold the code according to best practices for your strategy. So uh, as you can see here, we got Go, Builder, V2, and V3, mm -hmm. but if you will, I never use Quarkus, honestly, because you know, uh, I don't like Java, but it's just a matter of taste. But if you would like to implement the, your operator uh, with a um, more opinionated way for Quarkus, you just need to use the plugin. So the generated code is going to be scaffolded according to your uh, scaffolding strategy. And what's really cool is that you can also use create your own plugins because what I really love regarding Kubernetes and besides also operator is that if you would like to extend the um, capabilities of Kubernetes, like custom resources or extended API servers, it's that simple, absolutely that simple. And That's amazing uh, what yeah. you say. So basically uh, this is a pluggable interface. If I want to write my, let's say Rust uh, operator SDK plugin, 
I can just uh, create this plugin and insert in this uh, architecture. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I cool. don't know honestly how to do that <laughs> because I'm just working with Bergo stuff and I'm feeling comfortable with this. But yeah, version I saw three. from the oh, version three. Yeah, I I also worked with the V2, but um, is there the, any difference between V2 V3? Just to yeah, understand. yeah. I remember that because I converted Capsule, that is our multi-tenancy operator at Classics, from V2 and to to V3. And it has been a pain, honestly, but <laughs> I survived that. I lost my hair. Well, no, joking. I lost my hair. <laughs> you you, you were having a blonde, long hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just joking. But yeah, you can convert that. There were there was also a guide regarding how to translate from V2 to V3 because uh, I still remember that in V2 there were many int functions in Go. So keep in mind that Go provides several ways to group your code. You got the modules, or I would say the packages, and each package provides a way to initialize it, okay? And this init function is going to be executed when you are importing your package. And there are some linters or some meta linters that discourage the use of init functions. So, it's really cool that starting from V3, uh, we don't have any more in it. I would say that uh, it's just a matter of styling stuff. There are no huge side effects besides the fact that uh, init functions are just function. You don't have uh, error handling. So it's really tough to manage the error handling, but you know, uh, it's just a matter of style. Uh, okay. I would say that if you will get, if you will start writing your operator, uh, going for the latest version is safe and okay. wise. Okay, yeah. as a newbie, uh, I want to start creating my operator. I, I uh, is that the default option? Can yeah, it's the default. To... okay, okay, it's the default one. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, as I show you early, so when we run Operator SDK, we got all this stuff saying we can do a lot of stuff. We got the bundle, cleanup, completion, create. So what we are going to do right now is to focus on the init. So we have to initialize a new project. Otherwise, we cannot do uh, anything else. OK, so what I do every time that I issue a command, I read the readme or the help. So how can I do that? I have to issue Operator SDK. If I would like to, I can also set the plugins and then we got the domain and the owner. So keep in mind that right now uh, with this uh, uh, statement, we are creating Go code, but we are scaffolding just the operator. So to do that, I'm going to issue uh, operator SDK in it, and then let's go for the flags. I would like to put the domain. So the domain for groups. So domain, I will say that we could use the default one, my domain. And then we have to set also the license. Let's for let's go for the Apache 2, the owner. The owner, I'm going to say my GitHub account from Ethereum. And the project name, project name, I will say my operator. And then we have to set also the project version. I am referring to the Go scaffolding, the version of QBuilder. So the free, the latest one is good enough. And finally, we have also to set also our repository. Let's go for github.com from Ethereum, my operator. Okay. With this, what we are going to do is to get a scaffolding of all the resources that have been created. So. As you can see, we got the Docker file, the go mod, hack, main, make file, and project. So this is our starting point. Uh, at this point, what I would suggest is to perform a git init, git commit everything, first commit, OK? Or initial commit. Uh, what's so really... git, git first approach, what, what the, what's the name of this, this approach? Uh, I don't know the name, but I really love also why I'm coding to see the diff, the git diff, to understand what's going on. Because since we are talking about scaffolding, uh, sometimes you are missing the focus on what Operator SDK is going to do. So hmm. just to show with all the people, 
I'm going to do the to do that. So it was git init, yeah. So git com. Oh, let me check. Yeah, we have to add everything. Git commit, and let's say the, that is, is a shortcut. G A A. You have a ah, shortcut. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> because I I faces so many outages issues. So every second is really important. So I got a lot of aliases. So G A A is Git add all. <laughs> Okay. GST is git status and GC is git commit. Maybe you can share your uh, aliases, uh, your bash aliases to the. <laughs> well, <laughs> these are the default one offered by ZSH, but I got another one that I really love that is kill P. And oh, kill P oh. is to kill a pod with grace period equals to zero and force. Because sometimes you are ending up with pods that are the, out there uh, in waiting state, terminating staying, and Oh my gosh, I have to wait. No, 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 no. I'm in production. I have to kill everything. So yeah. Kill I see it. Tero is laughing and also crying. So maybe he's thinking about any pod you couldn't delete, uh, Tero. Do you do you force uh, yeah, him having this git first approach? Of of course, but about killing pods, <laughs> yeah. I, I maybe kill n also, so killing a namespace when you have a finalizer waiting something and you try to find out what is it's waiting. So maybe I need to create a shortcut for that also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Patching the namespace, removing finalizers, or at yeah. this point, I will say that we could create also an alias to SSH, to the control plane, connect to etcd, and removing the key of the namespace will be much, much better. Just joking, you know, but it's pretty simple. Yeah, <laughs> OCRSH, etcd, OpenShift, etcd. Yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> Uh, anyway, good idea. Folks, uh, before uh, Luca in the chat was saying the way the operator looks like inside Kubernetes might be a technical detail, but it's very important to understand the concept of reconciliation loop and the side state ver versus actual state. So this is what what Dario was saying, mentioning. I think Dario, we will go into re again into reconciliation loop, but yeah. but that is the main topic. So thanks, Luca, for your note uh, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, let's commit. So git commit. I will say git commit. And let's go for initial commit. Yeah, we got our operator. Everything has been committed. So we are on master. So let's take a look also to what we have right now. So I hope that you are familiar with Go in case you're not that's not a big problem so we got a got mod file so go mod file and here it is so essentially we got our module that is github.com from ethereum my operator and if you recall correctly it's the one that i put it where where are you here it is so essentially this repo is going to be used here we are using uh, Go version 1.16. Uh, doesn't matter because this has been scaffolded in this way. You can use Go 1.17. In fact, I'm using that. And we got some dependencies. So we got API machinery. We got the client Go and the controller runtime. Uh, keep in mind that operator SDK, I, I don't want to say bad words regarding operator SDK, but operator SDK is just a scaffolding tool, OK? because we have to pay kudos we have to say thank you a lot of thanks honestly to the controller runtime special interest group because essentially uh, the operator uh, components are managed by this special interest group or rather i would say by this library by this module or whatever you would like to call them since we are in the go context i would say uh, in this module so we are using the 0 0.10. I don't remember the first time I used that. I used them. It was maybe 0 0.4. Wow, you remember, remember also the the versions? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Good memory. Know. 0 uh, yeah. 4 x uh, Tero, because... Andrea, do, you, do you recall your dependency version in your in your head? Blackout. <laughs> I don't think they yeah, remember. Yeah, I, I remember honestly because I was playing a lot. A, <laughs> what is a dependency? <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I got a dependency on Kubernetes, but yeah, uh, 
I never told them to my wife, but I guess she is suspecting <laughs> something. Anyway, yeah, I remember my dependencies because I had so many issues while I was trying to upgrade from back and forth from a version. So that's the reason why I'm remembering that. Anyway, uh, with the Go modules, it's a sort of package.lock in Node.js or rather composer.json in PHP or whatever you would like to use to lock your dependencies. This is not the lock file, obviously. The lock file is stored in go.sum where we got everything. Yeah, pretty nice. Ashes, ashes. Cool. Ashes everywhere. But what I would like to get uh, more focus is the project file, OK? Because with project file, what I really love is the fact that we are storing in a declarative way how we are structuring our operator. So essentially, uh, we are storing the version. And this is, is really cool to understand also for newcomers that are we using version 2, version 3? Which plugins are we using or not? What's the project name, the repository, the layout, and the domain? Since these are essential also when we are generating types and APIs. Why API and types? Because the main difference between a controller and an operator is that the controller is managing the Kubernetes resources. So deployment services, uh, endpoints, config maps, secrets, whatever you want. Sometimes I call them um, the default resources. I know that maybe the name is not the right one, but I'm referring to the APIs offered by default by the API server. The operator instead is managing custom resource definition, CRDs. So essentially, we are translating a CRD, something that is not standard in Kubernetes, to create something, not directly, but sometimes we create something inside of the Kubernetes cluster. So we are translating this CRD, this custom resource definition instance, in something that is going to be deployed inside the cluster. So um, since uh, I recall there was a question regarding Luca uh, about the operator pattern, so on and so forth. Yeah, it's also regarding uh, the pattern behind that. But also keep in mind that the operator, to be classified like an operator, must manage also custom resource definitions. Otherwise, it will be a simple controller, a custom controller, OK? And with that said, I guess that we can also take a look to what we have here. So I would start also from the make file. Let's go for BI. So there is a plenty of stuff here, honestly. Uh, a, lo a, lo a lot of targets. But this is really cool because um, I hope you all love makes file. Honestly, I love them because it's old school automation. And I really love that, although I, I'm pretty young, I guess so. But uh, with the make file, we got a lot of stuff because essentially we have all the management of our operator. So how to deploy an operator? We have to build the binary. We have to build the Docker image. We have to build the manifest. We have to install the manifest. We have also to manage the full life cycle of the operator. So installing and uninstalling. And everything is here in this make file. Obviously, it's just a scaffolded one. Uh, for Capsule, for example, we extended it a little bit. Um, but it's really cool because you don't have to write on your own. It's only automated. Uh, it's all generated. Uh, you don't have to do anything. So if I would like to test, I just need to issue make test end of the story. And obviously, we got some prerequisites like creating a manifest, generating the code generation part, uh, performing the FMT, VT. These are a sort of linters and scaffolding also the MTest. test. So uh, this is really cool. And just a suggestion from my side, let's use as much as you can the make file. Oh, the great uh, return on the make file. Great to hear, as you know, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, glorious but, make file. But that's actually interesting since that you can just basically put it as an 
let's say GitHub action uh, and run the, everything in there based on your commits and you don't have to build it locally and push it. So it's it's kind of cool. You have everything ready. Like yeah, you yeah. mentioned, when you use NASDK, you save a lot of time. Yeah. Keep in mind that actually we are using on Capsule the make file also to scaffold the end-to-end -end test suite because uh, since it's an operator to manage multi-tenancy, uh, we would like to test with real Kubernetes also because we have to ensure a compatibility matrix. So we have to test on Kubernetes 1.16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and so on and so forth. And using the make file is really cool because you have to write your GitHub action, say make end-to-end -end slash the version, end of the story. And also from the developer experience, uh, if a new developer is developing something for Capsule, what he has to do is just to issue that make target, end of the story. Otherwise, it will be a pain. So abstracting the CI stuff. Uh, Dario, there's a comment in the chat. Luca is saying that the operator doesn't have only to manage Kubernetes resources, but also sure. manage external resources. And he was pointing out to the Cloudflare operator example. Yeah, yeah, that's true. In fact, uh, maybe I, I used the right words, but I was trying to say that the operator can manage or not Kubernetes resources because mm -hmm. uh, there is something really cool project out there like the Cloudflare one, although I never use that, but also take a look to, I don't remember the name, uh, Crossplane, Crossplane, okay? With Crossplane, cross you're creating custom res Well, you have plenty of custom resources, mostly for infrastructure stuff that are generating stuff outside of your Kubernetes cluster. So I would like to get the Postgres SQL database managed on Azure or whatever you want. You just need to create the instance and there you go. Obviously, maybe will be helpful also having additional resources like, I don't know, uh, the secrets uh, containing the connection string to that Postgres SQL. But, you know, I hope that you get uh, the point about that. But yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, that's cool. And also, Dario, since you mentioned we are there, there's a new operator we are building here in Red Hat, which called uh, is a service called the Red Hat uh, um, Open, uh, uh, Open Database Database Access Roda. Uh, so basically, it connects. Uh, it's an operator that connects the uh, deployment your deployment uh, to a, a database as a service uh, on some uh, third party SaaS. So the database is elsewhere. Uh, your your pods are in the cluster, but they are connected, and the operators make sure this connection uh, is uh, exists and uh, works out of the box. So yeah, uh, thanks, Luca, for your um, your point. No, no, Talit, that that sounds almost like a smooth operator. Smooth, uh, yeah, operator. smooth operator. Like, <laughs> like, a, like a, so we, we don't have the right to send music. We can only send that music you, you see at the beginning. But that would be a really nice thing to do. A smooth operator. Smooth operator. And I would say, uh, just for a reference, Forza Ferrari. Uh, because if you're following Ferrari, Formula One, you know, Carl Sainz always said, smooth operator. Ah, <laughs> anyway, sorry, sorry. Forza Ferrari. Anyway, uh, at the same time, let's go also to take a look to the code because this is really cool. Okay. I'm using Beam, uh, you know, but I got also Goland. So uh, maybe it's not, no, no, let's not talk about uh, other tools. So let's use VI. Okay. So this is our main goal. And as you can see here, we got several stuff like this, cube builder scaffold imports. And this is the proof that there is a huge connection between operators decay and cube builder. So uh, you can take a look to the documentation of cube builder and you will see that will be applicable also for operators decay. So what is going to do cube builder scaffold imports? Since the operator needs to manage custom resource definitions, we have to import that in our code base. And this is just a marker because when we are creating a new API type and we will see that uh, this is going to be imported here in an automated way. And the same applies also here. Unfortunately, we still have some init functions. That's not a big problem, honestly, but just to show that, uh, you know, let's be pragmatic. 
So we got a plenty of stuff and what I really love also regarding controller manager. And I guess that was the question by Tero. Should we write our operators on our own or using uh, SDKs or libraries and so on and so forth? I will say that uh, thanks to the controller manager and the controller and time special interest group, we could get a manager of our con custom controller that is managing a custom resource definition. And so it's going to be defined an operator that got everything bundled it. So it means that I got metrics, I got the webhook servers, I got the indexers, I got everything that is really good to write operators. Okay, we will uh, have also the opportunity to see everything. Anyway, uh, just to show you, uh, our operator is going to be managed by a manager. So essentially we are listening on a specific port and this is a port you will ask me, why do we have a port here? Well, with webhooks, we need webhooks. And then we got several options. But it's pretty straightforward. I mean, uh, if you try to take a look uh, to this code, you see that we got several flags. So we are accepting some flags to this binary. We are setting the logger. We are initializing our manager. And then we are adding some health probes. And then finally, we are starting the manager. End of the story. It's pretty that simple. And with that said, uh, I would like just to add also uh, a note regarding the webhook. Why we need webhook? Because keep in mind that the custom resource definitions are going to be installed using um, a resource. And this resource is a sort of open API specification B3, okay? And with that said, we don't have so much control on the validation of data, okay? And it means that if we would like to put in place some specific validations, like you can use, I don't know, uh, even or odd numbers or just uh, the Fibonacci uh, scheme, uh, you have to implement your own validation. And this validation is- put Now in place. tell me, now tell me the Fibonacci scheme. Please uh, start with the uh, series. Uh, uno, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> I started in Italian, uno. so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one, one, uh, two, five, uh, okay, eight, okay, and so okay, so okay, okay, okay. I'm not good. Challenge uh, accepted, challenge one, yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, it's a test. Are you trying to hire me for Red Hat? I don't know, oh. <laughs> we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> uh, I have to apply, maybe anyway. Um, just trying to say that if you would like to put something, uh, a validation, a custom validation, you need webhook. And webhook are really important also for uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, we all know, I guess, uh, Open Policy Agent. We know Kiverno. There are plenty of resources out there that are using the dynamic admission control and so validating webhooks or also mutating webhooks to perform a sort of, a sort of policy enforcement on your cluster. This policy enforcement could be also applied to your custom resource for the validation or whatever you would like to achieve. But since time is running out, like the Muse song, I don't know if you remember that, but I was playing a lot of Muse music. Uh, let's take a look also to how to create my custom resource definition. So we got a command and the command is create and we got the create API. We got also the webhook. So a webhook for an API resource. What I'm going to say is, okay, let's create the API and it says create resource, but mm, I don't like this stuff. Let's go for H. So uh, where is the help? So we got operator ZK, create API, and we can specify the group and the version and the kind, okay? Let's go for the example. The, so we are sticking to that. Oh my gosh, let me copy that. So take a look to this. So we are defining a group that is going to be named sheep, a version and a kind. And just to show what are we referring to is that every time that we have a custom resource definition, we got some special fields like API version and kind. 
Okay. And the API version is always made of um, three parts. So we got the group, the group and the version and the kind. This is from the code perspective. But in the YAML definition, we got these two fields. So the group could be my group slash v1 and the kind could be my kind or kind, my kind would be better. So essentially we are designing the metadata of our customer resource. And in fact, if we, if we try to create that, we got also some inputs like, would you like to create a resource? Obviously, yes. And the controller, obviously, yes. And here we are. So what I'm referring regarding the controller, uh, keep in mind that this could be uh, a bit disturbing because we are trying to implement an operator and we are talking about controller, but the controller in, th in this case is referring to the manager controller, the one that we saw, uh, uh, it was Red Hat, my, oh my gosh. Uh, it was documents, Red Hat, my operator, VI, main. MGR, yeah, I'm referring to this one. So we got a manager that is managing several controllers and each controller is controlling a custom resource definition. And with that said, let's take a look and yeah, we got everything. So as you can see here, we got a lot of stuff. We got some make targets that are creating, we got new files. And in fact, if we try to issue git status, GST, we got some uh, changes and some untracked files. So let's go for the git diff. Ah, yeah, GD is git diff. So- Oh, uh, I don't know if you know Alessio from the chat, Alessio Greggi, he say, Dario, everyone hates your short shortcut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as you can see here, uh, when we create a new, pro a new API, these APIs are going to be injected inside the project. And it's really cool because taking a look at uh, taking a look to the project, I can understand which custom resources are going to be managed by this operator. And obviously, we got also a lot of stuff regarding the go mode. And this is more interesting because if we take a look to the main, take a look here. So we got the cube builder scaffold imports. So we got our um, pointer, our cube build pointer is saying we have to add something new so we are adding ship v1 beta 1 and we got also the controllers so instead of doing this manually that could be error prone i just need to issue my command using operator sdk and the same also applies for the util runtime registering uh this is required by because we are not using the uh, it's a, also a long discussion regarding the client to interact with the API server. So we have to register the scheme. Otherwise we cannot interact with the API. And finally, since we got our manager, we got our controller where we are injecting our client from the manager, the scheme from the manager, and we are setting up that. Uh, keep in mind that this is weird because as you can see, we are generating the controller, then setting up with the manager, but injecting the manager inside of that. So um, it's a bit tricky, but it's working. Uh, it's something that honestly, I don't like so much regarding the scaffolding by Operator SDK, but you know, uh, it's working, it's good enough. So <laughs> I'm not complaining about that. And mostly what's really cool is that we got also uh, new files like this one. We got API v1 beta 1 and we got our frigate types. So with that said, uh, it's not operator SDK, but it's QBuilder that is managed by operator SDK. This is doing all the magic. So essentially we got our package, our versioning, we got our spec, our status, and also the list struct. All this stuff must be managed by the controller or rather by the manager in order to install everything and being able to get, update, delete, patch, and list custom resources like this way, in this way. 
And we got also a lot of generated files like this one uh, that, that generated deep copy. Okay. Since we don't have um, generic single, we are coping with uh, code generation. So this is mandatory in order to interact also with some um, uh, utilities offered by the Kubernetes code base. Code base. So the deep copy, deep copy method must be implemented, otherwise it would be a pain. And with that said, uh, we are ready because in the end, we scaffolded an operator, just the code base. We scaffolded an API in less than, I would say, 40 minutes. And honestly, it's absolutely mesmerizing. Uh, when I was working at my first operator implementation, I did everything on my own and I spent a lot of days and it was full of bug, <laughs> absolutely full of bug. And what's really cool is that we got also tests and it's really important having tests, especially when you are writing operator. Uh, I would say that tests are uh, absolutely important when you're developing software. But especially test, with operators, test-driven development. Ah uh, uh, no, any, I'm not. Any I'm not particular. No, no? no, I'm not a big fan of that. Honestly, no, 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 no. Okay, Maybe because I'm, I'm. I guess because I'm not so good at developing, so uh, no. <laughs> I'm. I'm not trying to. Uh, uh, I don't like the TDD, honestly. But I prefer the end-to-end, -end, honestly. Just a matter of taste, by the way. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's I think a philosophy. I don't know, Tero, Andrea, which philosophy you follow? TDD, not TDD, just test, not test. Uh, I have I don't write bugs methodology, so I don't have to test anything because there is no bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with TDD. It is kind of usually you create the logic and then you write the test cases that work, and then you have TDD. It always goes a uh, wrong way around and it never works. So end-to-end -end testing is the thing that you, you should be doing. Well, uh, I totally agree with the TDD approach when it's possible. Right. Um, so I have a couple of questions though, because we're, we're basically running out of time. Yeah. Um, or maybe that could be the topic for another for another session on operators. Um, how do you actually implement the control? How do you actually determine what data you need? And where do you get it get it from from changes in the resource definition, for example, and then and how do you check if uh, changes need to be made, to be made? Dario, I, I think and, and and Andrea spoiler it our next episode. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think that by the way, um, when I try to design a, a custom resource definition, I would say that too long did the red. Uh, it's the specification. It's writing the right specification. And writing the right specification is like writing APIs, because keep in mind that custom resource definitions are going to be used like APIs. Whenever we interact with the API server, essentially we are doing pot, uh, put, post, patch, get resources. So uh, starting from the beginning, with the right approach, with the right struct, and everything else is absolutely mandatory. And what I really love from Kubernetes itself is that when you make mistakes, like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot this, I don't know, uh, this field or this feature, you can cope with annotations. I know that a lot of people hate annotations, but at the same time, also using operators since you are the owner of your custom resource, you can use versioning. And that's really, really cool because with versioning, you can create new features without any breaking change. But it's a long topic. Uh, we can talk about that. Definitely, definitely, Dario. So thanks for this, uh, thanks for this session. Well, we basically scaffolded a new operator in uh, 20 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, talking about also your Git analysis. I think it was really 
15 minutes. It was great. So this is, was an example on how to scaffold a new operator. And, it, uh, and it's part of our new series about uh, how to write an operator, or just uh, writing operators uh, uh, on Kubernetes. So this was the first episode. And I'm really happy that you, uh, you explained it very good, uh, either the internals of Kubernetes, then the internals uh, of the uh, operators, how to scaffold a new operator, and how to create a, the first skeleton of a new app. To answer also the question from Andrea, we will have a second episode, uh, again with Dario, because we, we like uh, how he explained the things. Uh, it's really good. Um, and how, what we should take, uh, what, what we should put in, in the controller, um, in this controller. And uh, right now we are, we, are he- we are going out of time. So I would like to close up everything. Uh, with, with what we, we have seen. So we, we, we have the, uh, this uh, overview on Operator SDK. Dario is the author on an uh, operator, uh, which is the capsule operator. So you can see what he made live with Operator SDK. He created the capsule operator, which is a, an operator for bringing multi-tenants in Kubernetes. He also presented it on KubeCon last time. So uh, please check out the repo I, I put in the chat. And let me also uh, leave some uh, other appointments. Today, uh, OpenShift TV is live. You can check uh, the, the live streaming today, uh, what, what we have in the schedule. We will come back, uh, Andrea, Tero, uh, we will come back again uh, next Wednesday, uh, Wednesday uh, the 9th, uh, together with the winners of the Red Hat Act Fest. We, we're going to celebrate them. Um, for the operator series, we come back on March the second with Sebi uh, and another uh, people person from our engineering talking about the outright operator also in Java with the Quarkus uh, uh, plugin, and then we come back with Dario again. Where we will uh, sync on on the next uh, appointment where we want to implement the second part of this uh, operator. Uh, I think I, I've shared everything. Do you have any final uh, thoughts, uh, things to say? Uh, Andrea, Tero, Dario? Write your code, write your operators. <laughs> and oh, the story. Yeah. I like it. I yeah, like but, it. Uh, this, this was, uh, this was per- perfect for the, the explaining the need. This answered my question about why the SDK. Perfect. That was the reason of this episode. I'm glad we we, we reached this goal and happy the audience also enjoyed uh, this episode. Uh, the episode is going to be recorded at the same link you have either in uh, YouTube and it's going to be available also on, on Twitch if you are following from Twitch. So folks, thank you for joining us today. It was really a pleasure to have you. Uh, our next appointment is uh, always on OpenShift TV on the schedule you have in the chat uh, or with uh, the OpenShift Coffee Break uh, We will come back next Wednesday, 10 a.m. here at OpenShift TV. So thanks to you. uh, Thank you, Hall. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. Uh, Talk soon. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.